Welcome to the fabulous 413. I'm Monty Belmonte. Coming up later in the show, Amherst's Hannah Mushebeck and her new children's book, Homeland, My Father Dreams of Palestine. Hannah's father is the publisher of a local publishing company, Interlink. And her uncle, who is also featured in her book, is the owner of BookLink Booksellers in Northampton. We'll talk books, bookstores, publishing, and Palestine coming up later in the show. A story that caught my attention today from the Republican in Mass Live, written by my friend Dave Eisenstatter, East Hampton protests scheduled Monday over rescinded superintendent job offer. The article starts, supporters of Vito Perón, who said his job offer to be East Hampton's next superintendent was rescinded last week, will gather in East Hampton on Monday evening to show their support. Perone, the current interim superintendent of West Springfield Public Schools, was offered the job on March 24th on a 4-3 vote by the school committee, but the offer was rescinded following an email Perone sent about upcoming contract negotiations to school committee chairwoman Cynthia Kwasinski, who voted against Perone getting the job, and the board's executive assistant, Suzanne Colby, according to Perone. Perone said he was told members were offended that he addressed the email to, quote, ladies called the term a microaggression and rescinded the job offer. Perone says in the Mass Live article, to rescind an offer because I used the address of ladies to the chair and the executive assistant is ridiculous, it seems pretty capricious, and it doesn't seem right. He added that the use of ladies was the only reason given and that an apology was not even possible. My question for you, the listeners of the fabulous 413, is the word ladies offensive to you? In your estimation, is it a microaggression? Is it a microaggression that rises to the level of losing a job opportunity? I'm particularly interested in hearing from you if you identify as female. Text us your thoughts, 1-800-639-9120, and tell me what you think about the use of ladies in this story coming out of East Hampton today. We'll hear your thoughts later in the show, but first... To boldly go where no man has gone before. Kitchen Table Astronomy with Hampshire College astronomer Dr. Salman Hamid, Mr. Universe here in Amherst. Big news today is the release of the names of the astronauts on the Artemis mission to the moon. But full disclosure, that is happening after we're chatting. So, with Come the on. miracle of digital editing, here they are! This is our crew. This is humanity's crew. May I introduce them to you all? She's an engineer who got her start at Goddard and is no stranger to breaking records, logging the longest continuous space flight ever by a woman, your mission specialist, Christina Hammett Koch. He is a master of science in physics, an F-18 pilot, and a Canadian astronaut. Your mission specialist, Jeremy Hansen. He's a naval aviator and test pilot that's flown over 40 different aircraft. Your Artemis II pilot, Victor Glover. He's a decorated naval aviator, test pilot, and leader of the highest character. Your Artemis II commander, Reed Wiseman. Ladies and gentlemen, your Artemis II crew. First off, that NASA guy just said ladies. Second of all, I thought that the crew was going to be all women. Artemis was the twin sister of Apollo. So we'll hear more about that next week. We're going to talk about it next week when we have, like, you know, a little bit more information about yeah, it. We get to know them a little bit. That's better. exactly yeah. right. But we uh, should see what our favorite friend astronaut from Shelburne, Katie Coleman, thinks about the crew. No, I think it's a, I think it's a big news. Big, uh, and we, of course, we will talk about it later. <laughs> the other big news is the James Webb Space Telescope, which launched a year ago-ish, the largest infrared telescope in the universe that we know of. <laughs> and it's been spending time looking at a particularly interesting spot. Right. So uh, actually, it's been over a year for oh, really? James Webb Space Telescope. That was uh, December of uh, 21, although with the pandemic, it's all confusing oh, now. So who knows? But the first results from James Webb Space Telescope were released in July of last year. Mm -hmm. So that is true. But one of the things, one of the objects that everybody was waiting for was to look at TRAPPIST-1 system. Uh, is it filled with monks who brew beer? That is exactly what I was thinking about. <laughs> no, 
that is actually cool. Like, you know, we can talk about monks, we can yeah. talk about beer, but this system is still really crucial. And the reason is because it has seven Earth-sized planets orbiting this star. So How many does our solar system have? One? Or does Mars count as an Earth, Earth-sized planet? Well, if you, if you talk about sort of like rocky planets, then uh, certainly a Mercury, a Venus, Earth, and Mars. Interesting planets. No offense to Mercury, but interesting planets would be Venus, Earth, or Mars because they are close to the habitable zone and life could have or and did in one case certainly did emerge. Having rocky planets, small rocky planets is a really big deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, this particular star is not like the sun. So Trappist-1 is much smaller uh, th uh, than our sun. It's called a red dwarf. I but it's, it's much cooler than our sun. But these type of stars are much more abundant in the universe mm -hmm. and they live much longer lives. And so this is interesting. And we think that these type of like Trappist-1 type small red stars, they contain more terrestrial planets, more Earth-like planets than a star like our sun. And so, so anyway, so th I'm just setting the stage up. As you can tell, we may not have that exciting news <laughs> about the actual <laughs> planets. I'm setting the stage up of why this system is so important to study. And uh, this star was, uh, was uh, discovered, uh, I think, in, in the 1990s. And TRAPPIST actually is a telescope. Uh, there are two telescopes, one in the Southern Hemisphere in Chile, it's a robotic telescope, and then there is another one in the Atlas Mountains in Morocco. So, uh, and actually, I should mention, because astronomers are terrible at naming things. Oh, as, yeah, you guys are You know, really very bad. large array, really, really large array. Well, yeah. I don't know if that is the That's case. That's why you but, kind of name the telescopes. The fact that the James Webb Space Telescope, despite the uh, problematic nature of the life and le legacy of James Webb, at least has a name that people can remember. Right, so this particular one, TRAPPIST, uh, it's actually Transiting Planets and Planetesimal Small Telescope. Uh -huh. So it's kind of cool, cool, and yeah. it's Belgian, so like, you know, so that oh, hence, hence cooler, the TRAPPIST yeah. connection that, uh, that comes in, and these are like 24-inch telescopes, but they're robotic, and that's how this star was discovered in uh, 1999. But then, it, the, uh, then astronomers detected planets orbiting around it, and not just one, but seven. Mm -hmm. And astronomers named these, so the first planet detected around a star, it's given a designation of small b. And so TRAPPIST-1b is the one, the first one discovered. So it has b, c, d, e, f, g, h, and they are actually in order. So b is the closest one, and then c, d, e. As it turns out, this is an unusually compact system. So all of these planets fit within, way within the orbit of Mercury for our sun. Wow. So if all of our planets in our solar system were between the sun and Mercury, this is like this TRAPPIST system we're looking at right now. Much more closer. In fact, the closest one, so which is TRAPPIST-1b, that takes only one and a half Earth days to go around its star. And the farthest one, takes 19 days. So that's a year. The farthest, that, the for, longest for that, year yes. in, that, in that solar system is 19 days. And for Mercury, it takes 88 Earth days. So already, so you can see it's a very compact system, but the star is much cooler. So despite of that, there are at least three of these planets, which are D, E, and F, which we think they are in the habitable zone, meaning to say that they are far enough from the star that in theory, water can exist in liquid form. Sometimes they call it the Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, not too cold, just right. Oh, that's too hot, that's too cold, and that's just right. With all of this mythology and fairy tales, I mean, it's a, it's a red dwarf star, there are seven little, you know, <laughs> plants around there. It feels like we're talking about, uh, Snow White here. <laughs> That's right. I think this this planet should be named Disney. <laughs> <laughs> well, soon enough, Disney will own it. <laughs> that, that's right. So that's one of the reasons why James Webb Space Telescope, because it can potentially detect atmospheres around it. And if you can detect atmosphere, you can figure out, for example, if there is uh, oxygen in the atmosphere or not. And on Earth, 
the uh, oxygen here, molecular oxygen in the atmosphere was actually a result of life. And so that is sort of like one of the indirect signatures that you can detect. And so Hubble Space Telescope and there was another space telescope, Spitzer Space Telescope, they tried pushing their limits and tried to see atmospheres and they didn't see it. But the problem was they weren't really pushing their limits. James Webb Space Telescope can really, is designed to look for these things and they have been looking at this particular system. And so far, Astronomers have released the results of only TRAPPIST 1b, which is the closest one, one and a half days. It takes one and a half days to go. It's not in the habitable zone. And uh, the results are, uh, drum roll, please, Monty. Uh, no atmosphere. Oh, dang and, it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but look, first of all, it is amazing that we can actually detect Sort of like, you know, whether there is an atmosphere or not. They, because the planet, in this case, is reflecting light. And it's reflecting light in the infrared. And James Webb Space Telescope is designed to look at that. And it can figure out how hot this planet that is orbiting around TRAPPIST-1, which is actually, by the way, 40 light years away. So relatively close, but still quite far. And it's a very small star and a small planet around it. And they can figure out what temperature there is. And it turns out it's too hot. Oh, that's too hot. Yeah, which would be expected. Nevertheless, they did not see any atmosphere around TRAPPIST-1b. Now, we know other planets in this system have been observed, but uh, well, they haven't given us the information. Maybe it's going to be sequels, like, you know, next year, TRAPPIST-1c and 1d. <laughs> but uh, I just but watched John Wick 4. <laughs> and I was like, wow. Did he have an atmosphere? He did. Yes. Okay, there you Keanu go. always had aura. An Yeah, there you go. Yeah, not really. So right now, it's a good test of technology to a certain degree. We got a lot of information. And this is the first time, actually, that we have really gotten good information about an Earth-sized planet in terms of the atmosphere. If you remember, uh, one of the first results from James Webb Space Telescope was an atmosphere around WASP-39b. And so that was a very hot planet and uh, around, I think it was around a sun-like star, but that was expected to be very hot, no life in there, but there was an atmosphere around it and it detected that. Here is a case that we are actually looking at a system which, first of all, is much more common. Uh, and secondly, that James Webb Space Telescope can actually give you information about what is happening to a certain degree on the planet. Even if this result is negative, remember, the really interesting ones are D, E, and F, which are the three other planets that are in the habitable zone. These are the ones that we'll be looking for. So we can skip the results of C. We'll just assume. Forget <laughs> it. We want, we want to hear what's D, E, F, a deaf comedy jam. Oh, y'all look good. Y'all ready to have a good time tonight? Hey. Deaf Leopard. Yes, I'm getting it. Come on, Steve. That's where the, the life could be in this Trappist one. Right, but you know, we are in fabulous 413. Yeah. And I would like that to have sort of like, you know, a really fabulous skepticism. Uh -huh. And I know I'm going to be beating a dead horse regarding this, but I wanted to bring this up. Just look at how carefully astronomers are looking for. They're not like, hey, we really want to believe, we really think that the Trappist one has life. But look how carefully astronomers are going through. They are making sure, like, you know, that they rule out all other ways that these results be explained otherwise. And in this particular case, for example, if there is no atmosphere, there is no atmosphere. I'm a little sad, <laughs> but hey, like, you know, if it comes out that the other habitable zone planets don't have atmosphere, yeah, there will be a little sadness in it. But then that is the way it is. Compare that, you know where I'm going with that, about the UFOs, Yeah. right? I mean, like, oh my goodness, like, you know, we cannot explain these things, but not just that those are things that we don't know what those are, but rather those are spaceships crying from, crying from, sort of like you know, flying from somewhere else and so on and so forth. So this just gives you, again, one more time, an idea of how science works in general, or good science works, and some of the big claims that often turn out to be wrong and we don't have. So fabulous 413, fabulous skepticism. <laughs> Coming up, 
Amherst Hannah Mushebeck and her new children's book, Homeland, My Father Dreams of Palestine. We'll meet Hannah, her father, and her uncle, all featured in the new book and all part of the book publishing world. And a reminder of the story that caught my attention today from the Republican and Mass Live. East Hampton protests scheduled Monday over rescind, rescinded superintendent job offer. Supporters of Vito Peron, who said his job offer to be East Hampton's next superintendent, was rescinded last week when he addressed an email to, quote, ladies. Is the use of the word ladies offensive to you in your estimation? Is it a microaggression? And is it a microaggression that rises to the level of losing a job opportunity? I'm particularly interested in hearing from you if you identify as a female. You can text me your thoughts, 1-800-639-9120. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. Welcome back to The Fabulous 413. As bedtime approaches, three young girls eagerly await the return of their father who tells them stories of a faraway homeland, of Palestine, through their father's memories the old city of Jerusalem comes to life, the sound of juice vendors beating rhythms with brass cups, the smell of argila drifting through windows, and the sight of doves flapping their wings towards home. These daughters of the diaspora feel love for a place they've never been, a home they cannot visit. But as their father's story comes to an end, they know that through his memories, they will always return. Homeland! My Father Dreams of Palestine, a new children's book by Amherst author Hannah Mushebeck, a second-generation Palestinian-American author, editor, and book marketer who was raised in a family of publishers and booksellers, several of whom join us in the studio, all of whom are making their home in western Massachusetts. Uh, Hannah, born into Interlink Publishing, starting in Brooklyn, a family-run independent publishing house, which is now located here in western Mass, and learned the power of literature at a young age, Hannah Mushebeck. Welcome and congratulations on the book. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. I remember you from your time, I think specifically with children's books, at the Odyssey Bookshop, right? That's right. I've worked at quite a few bookstores in the Pioneer Valley um, and was fortunate enough to work with children's book authors, you know, across the valley with their book launches and their promotions and hand selling books to a lot of your kids out there. Now, you come from a book publishing family and a bookstore owning family. That doesn't always necessarily mean that you have the desire or talent to be <laughs> a, an author yourself. What was it that uh, turned the key for you where you said, I'm going to give this world that I live in on sort of the behind the scenes aspect of things uh, a world going forward? Yeah, you know, my sisters and I used to joke when we were growing up that we were going to be doctors. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, after being introduced to the concept that books can change the world and books can change lives, um, it was really difficult to do anything else. Mm. I grew up um, as a you know, infant, uh, learning my ABCs, um, you know, in my uncle's bookstore by shelving books, um, you know, being at book conferences with my parents playing under the table. Um, my first ever job was in my uncle's bookstore. So um, I was sort of led directly into this career and I have no regrets. Your uncle and your father, who the homeland My Father Dreams of Palestine is about, told sort of through his lens with your uncle in there as well. Uh, Michelle Mushebeck, people may know you, Hannah's father, um, because of your publishing Interlink Books, which is now located where? Uh, Interlink Books is, is now a 35-year-old Massachusetts-based, in Northampton, uh, independent publishing house. And it got its start in Brooklyn, right? We started in Brooklyn mm -hmm. in 1987, and then back in 1992, that's 30 one years ago, uh, we moved to the Valley. And your brother, Gabriel, is here, who um, had bookstores, as Hannah mentioned, grew up you know, learning the ABCs in, in Brooklyn, and also brought your bookstore here to Western Mass from Brooklyn. Um, that's right. Uh, I moved up here in 1997, in April of 1997. At that point, I had three bookstores, two of which were in Park Slope. One was in Stony Brook, Long Island. But the family used to vacation up here, and we liked the area a lot, and we thought it could use another bookstore. And so now you run BookLink, the wonderful bookstore and Thorns Marketplace right in downtown Northampton. That is correct. And then uh, you, your first book job, Hannah, was uh, at which bookstore in, in uh, Brooklyn? 
Uh, well. <laughs> Are they all called Link? Because well, well, that's what we should get out of here. We were joking off air that we should call the book Home Link, or you should have, because Interlink is the uh, name of the publishing company. Book Link is the name of the bookstore. Well, we should have brought our sister with us because she just drove down from Montreal and her bookshop up there, a children's bookshop called Kid Link. Well, tell me about why. why, why. <laughs> Was Link one of the names of the bookstores that you, yeah. you got your start at, Hannah? Well, I mean, when you say got my start out, I think I was five years old oh. when I hand sold my first book. Uh, at Still, Booklink. we'll count it. But it was absolutely. It was Booklink in Brooklyn as well. Correct. Tell me about the use of the word link in all in all of this. Why is this an important word to you that it's kind of become a moniker for what the Mushebek family's doing with books? Well, I, I can tell you a story about that, but it's and 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 in the early days, and that's of course before, you know, the web and all all that. Yeah. People use it now. People think link. You've got something to do with tech or whatever. But <laughs> that's not. But in those days, our idea was is that we are the link between cultures. Mm. You know, we what we publish, what we edit, what we acquire, and and our mission of interlink publishing is really to promote dialogue, to promote cross cultural learning. And, uh, and, 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 and a better understanding of other cultures. So that's where the link is. You know, the link is, is we uh, bring uh, the world closer to readers in America in the hopes that readers, you know, around the world will get closer to each other through literature. And that's the first link was interlink. But the real story is our name, Mushebek, in Arabic, means is interlink. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> <laughs> That's Michel Mushebek, Michel Interlink. Uh, his brother uh, Gabriel Interlink is here as well. And Hannah Interlink is here. And uh, if you want more of a digital link, there is an event happening at the bookstore I first met you at. Uh, a virtual event happening on Wednesday through the Odyssey Bookshop, but there are in-person links that can be made as well. Um, at the 6th, uh, in person at 6 p.m. at the Francis Crow Community Room right behind Woodstar in Northampton, sponsored by BookLink, the book link, uh, store in Thorns Marketplace, as well as the wonderful newish children's bookstore in Florence, High Five Books, this Saturday at 10 a.m., kids a story an arabic music dance party we're going to get more to the to the music aspect of things i think in a little bit but uh would you mind reading us a little bit from your book homeland my father dreams of palestine hannah mushabek of course our eyes are heavy with sleep but we want to hear more show us the key we cry my father produces the large rusted old key to our family's home in jerusalem we know the ending to the story is not a happy one we know that we never, may never sit and watch the juice man at Hafa Gate, but we whisper the hope of return as we turn out the lights. At night, we dream of our homeland. You Have you ever been to Jerusalem, Hannah Mushebek? No, I have not. And yet this is such an important story for you that you wanted to write a book about it. And through the lens of your father, Michel Mushebek, who joins us as well as his brother, Gabriel, tell me about... Um, when the last time you both were in Jerusalem? Well, my, uh, you know, we come from a, an old uh, Palestinian Eastern Orthodox Christian family uh, from, in, in, from the old city of Jerusalem. Uh, my parents left Jerusalem in 1948, but my grandfather, who was the Mukhtar, which is a word that means community leader, which is mentioned in this book. And there's a little glossary at the end too, so That's you can right. learn some Arabic <laughs> as well. <laughs> so because of his position in the Greek Orthodox Church, he was given residence inside the Greek Orthodox convent that abuts the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in the old city of Jerusalem. So, Which is where they believe Christ was uh, laid to rest That's and then correct. subsequently rose correct. from the dead. That's it's Easter week. That's it's also correct. Ramadan and <laughs> Passover. So, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, and uh, my parents, uh, after the 1948 war, kept on going to Lebanon. And uh, we were born there in Beirut. 
But my mother used to take us there every summer take to, you spend to Jerusalem, to, Jerusalem yeah. to the old city. And we stayed with my grandparents inside the Greek Orthodox convent. And uh, every year until the 1967 war. And at that time, I was barely 11 years old. My brother Gabriel was eight years old. That was the last time we saw our grandparents and the last time we saw Jerusalem. Gabriel, do you have any memories from that time being eight years old uh, of Jerusalem, a place that is you connected to your homeland, is your homeland, but that you have not gone, been back to since? Um, yeah, I have, I have uh, vivid memories of um, um, Easter because my grandfather would clutch my hand and so tight because it was so busy around the streets of the old city and um, um, they would have like a parade where they would walk uh, the Via Dolorosa and I remember vividly him talking about it. So that was, uh, and I, of course I do remember the, uh, the, uh, the convent or the house inside the convent where my grandparents lived um, and I do remember the smells of the streets um, of Jerusalem. But uh, other than that, uh, very little after that. The irony is that I am the person who has been in Jerusalem mo most recently of all these people in the room who are connected to the this book, Homeland, My Father Dreams of Palestine by Hannah Mushebek. I spent a semester there in 1998, a relatively peaceful time. The Clinton Camp David talks were happening. Things were starting to move forward. It was before the what they call the second intifada. And I lived exactly where much of this book takes place, right outside the old city walls. If you're not familiar with the, the geography and the lay of the land of Jerusalem, it's a beautiful old city and the walls uh, still stand. And then there's a more contemporary city uh, outside of those walls. And then there's East Jerusalem, which you can walk from one neighborhood to another neighborhood. And the drastic difference in the way the services are, the roads are paved, that kind of thing is, is stark for anybody who, like me, from a Western perspective, wants to see what the political situation is on the ground between the Palestinian side of the city of Jerusalem, the east side, and the, the quote-unquote new city in the western part of Jerusalem. Joined in studio here on the Fabulous 413 by Amherst Hannah Mushebek, whose new book, Homeland, My Father Dreams of Palestine, talks about the stories of her father, Michelle Mushebek, who is the publisher behind Interlink Books, and Gabriel Mushebek, who is the owner of Booklink Books in Thorns, I am glad to know that Mushebek means link, and we're going to uh, connect more of these links between Palestine and Jerusalem and, uh, and books and the valley. Uh, coming up in just a little bit, you're listening to The Fabulous 413 on New England Public Media. Welcome back to The Fabulous 413. I'm Monty Belmonte. I'm joined in the studio by Hannah Mushebeck, who has a new book, Homeland, My Father Dreams of Palestine. Her father, Michelle Mushebeck, is in the studio as well as her uncle, Gabriel Mushebeck, who are both featured uh, in this book. And as I've been mentioning before, uh, Hannah has lifelong links to the world of books, thanks to uh, her uncle's bookstores in Brooklyn and thanks to her father's book publishing company that is the links that that bring it all together um who was the first to enter into the world of books in a professional sense michelle mushebeck uh yes yes i was i was the first i uh i came from war-torn beirut to study at nyu uh i knew nothing about publishing i knew nothing about editing or distribution or whatnot, but uh, for me coming as a Palestinian and a young student activist in my early 20s, uh, coming to America from, from war-torn Beirut was uh, quite an, an eye-opening experience and a, and a, and a very life-changing experience for me. You know, immediately I embraced American values of democracy and education and the First Amendment and free speech and all that stuff. But then all of a sudden I found myself really getting upset and, and I was so disappointed in, in, in learning how little the people I met knew about where I came from and how unaccepting they were 
to Arab history and Palestinian narrative. So it was at that point in my life that I decided to change the course of my life from wanting to become an academic and to becoming a, a publisher. So that's at that point, it was, you know, in the mid 80s when that happened. And you were using this, these books that you were trying to publish to change people's minds and hearts using literature. Well, that's the idea because, you know, and I was also passionate about, about literature and translation. Mm -hmm. I was a voracious reader in my, in my younger days, and, and I wanted to introduce, you know, to Americans the amazing literature that I grew up with. So I started with a lot of literature and translation. Uh, we publish now about 60 books a year. Mm -hmm. You know, so we specialize in fiction and translation. We do a lot of history politics. We are known uh, in the U.S. as one of America's most awarded cookbook publisher, believe it or not. Yes. <laughs> I believe you were featured. Were you featured in another cookbook? It was my sister. Oh, your sister is. Yes, because the Mushebeck family is <laughs> sprawling. It's hard to keep you all. Yes. And that was a, a, a cookbook that was published in the, the rise of the Trump era where there was a lot of anti-immigrant rhetoric to try to say these are recipes that yeah, people can know and love from yeah. the immigrants who have come and to this country. And that's my oldest daughter, Leila Mushebek, and who was the author of The Immigrant Cookbook. Which I have on my shelf. <laughs> Uh, recipes that make America great. Mm. We're speaking with the Mushebek family. Hannah Mushebek, who has a new book, Homeland, My Father Dreams of Palestine. That was just her father, Michelle, speaking there. Growing up, surrounded by all these books, what are the books that you remember, while you've got an uncle and a father that are trying to change the world through literature, that you remember reading that changed your own personal world and sent you on your own course towards books and book publishing and now you work for Simon and Schuster as I mentioned before you worked at the Odyssey you worked at all sorts of bookshops in the area what were some of those first books that were made an indelible uh, mark on you yeah so growing up um, my sisters and I only had one book that was written by a Palestinian American about Palestine it was called City Secrets by Naomi Shihab Nye and she to this day um, is one of the most prolific children's book writers um, of Palestinian American descent but you know there was a, a real lack of other options um, in fact you know this book the book that I have just written will be the first book um, to be traditionally published by a large publisher the first since that book came out in 1994 wow. so almost 30 years what has the resp is this book officially out to other people that aren't don't have a radio show and get it early that's right <laughs> yes. it's out on Tuesday it came yeah. out <laughs> okay good so as, what has been the early response to this have you been um, hearing from a lot of people that have Palestinian descent have there been any has there been dissent in regards to it because it, again this is a, a still a hot button issue we hear about what uh, Netanyahu is doing right now in the judiciary in Israel that these are issues that are day in and day out dominating the dialogue of the United Nations. Yeah, so I mean the outpouring of love and support not just from the book community at large but Arab Americans and Palestinian Americans has been so incredible. I was at a conference last weekend where someone came up to me with a recorded message that her Palestinian friend wanted me to hear because she wanted me to hear the feeling in her voice when she cried on the phone and told me how incredible it was that she could introduce her daughters to her homeland through a book and that was the first time that that had ever happened to her. You know, I've been working in children's literature for 10 years, and we see again and again the scientific evidence that children seeing themselves represented in, their, in, in books and literature and media is so deeply integral to their confidence, to their learning. Um, you know, in my mission to increase diverse books through my job in publishing, you know, I've been able to work with some of the most incredible creators, you know, Raoul III, uh, Christian Robinson's early start. Um, I've been able to support, you know, local creators like M Mike Corrado and Grace Lynn. I've done events for them. And I always sort of had this question in the back of my mind, you know, what about my people? What about my nieces and nephews? You know, when are they going to see themselves represented as well? So that was sort of the <laughs> catalyst to get me to write this book. And, you know, w once the deal was acquired, I, I realized that I didn't want this to be the only book for another 30 years. Mm -hmm. 
so starting last year, I, I created a group called um, Palestinians and Kids Lit to help educate and inspire other writers. And I'm happy to say that there are five more children's books coming out in the next three years by Palestinian Americans. Taking up the family mantle and trying to change people's minds and opinions by exposing them to different points of view that are hard to access. We're speaking with the Mushebek family. That's Hannah Mushebek, whose brand new book, Homeland, My Father Dreams of Palestine, is out. There are at least three events that are going to be coming up that you can participate in a conversation with Hannah Mushebek about, including this Wednesday at 6 p.m., uh, where it will be on Zoom via the Odyssey Bookshop. Joined in conversation by Maha Mushebek? That's right. Is that your cousin, if I've done the math correctly? My sister. Okay, your sister. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of Mushebeks there. And then uh, the next day, in person, 6 p.m. at the Francis Crow Community Room, uh, sponsored by BookLink, the bookstore that her uncle Gabriel owns, and a high five in Florence on Saturday, April 8th at 10 a.m., a kid's story in Arabic music dance party, as well as the Carl uh, later in the month there at Carl Museum on April 17th. Uh, is the Arabic music at this Arabic music dance party going to have anything to do with your father, Hannah, Michel Mushebek, who many people, including my good buddy Kari Njiri in the other room over there, um, is a huge fan of in regards to his book. The, is it Layali Arabic Music Ensemble? You got it. And is that going to be who's bringing the music to this? Of course, but it would not be complete if the younger members of my family didn't also join the band. So there will be Sammy, Omar, and Una, my nieces and nephews, who are going to be joining the family band. Maybe you should give the a their ages. They are three, four, and six. Oh, my goodness. This Mushebek <laughs> clan continues to grow and expand. And when you read the book, Hannah, there's a lot of talk about the rhythms that your father experienced uh, from the streets of Jerusalem. Is that what informed you? You're a drummer. You're a fantastic drummer. Um, is that what? Uh, is that really where the inspiration for your your rhythm comes from? Those streets. Well, this is this is really one of the one thing that influenced me more than anything else as an 11 year old uh, kid was watching the hands of that juice vendor in the old city of Jerusalem. The juice vendor who goes from neighborhood to neighborhood. And he would announce his presence by playing all those intricate rhythms on brass or copper cups and saucers. Mm. And I would leave my, my grandfather and sit on the sidewalk, and my eyes would be fixed on the juice vendor's hands. And then later on during the day when I go back home, and to my grandmother's horror, I would practice those rhythms on her china and, and would end up with a spanking. <laughs> a, a rhythm of its own. <laughs> yes. Very repetitive, yeah. heart percussion. Uh, we're speaking with the Mushebek family, whose last name means Interlink. Uh, Interlink Publishing is Michelle Mushebek's publishing company. Gabriel Mushebek owns Booklink, the bookstore, and Thorns, and Hannah Mushebek. This is your first book, right? That's right. Yeah, coming from such a, like a storied, pun intended, career locally with the bookstores and getting to know you through that a little bit uh, to working at Ch Simon & Schuster, where you work now, to having this first book published. It's pretty amazing. I want to hear, um, when we come back, some more of your thoughts in regards to uh, access to stories that aren't often told in an era where people are trying to ban access to stories. And uh, we'll also, I want to hear you, the listeners, thoughts on what's been going on in East Hampton, the next superintendent... Uh, was rescinded as an offer to become the next superintendent there when he addressed an email to ladies. Is the use of the word ladies offensive to you? In your estimation, is it a microaggression? Is it a microaggression that rises to the level of losing a job opportunity? And I'm particularly interested in hearing from you if you identify as a female. You can text me your thoughts, 1-800-639-9120. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on New England Public Media. That is the Layali Arabic music ensemble that we're using as intro and outro music there, featuring the dulcet tones of the Mushebek family. Hannah Mushebek, not featured in the music, um, does have a new book out called Homeland, My Father Dreams of Palestine. Talking to parents and educators about her new book uh, this Wednesday and Thursday uh, in different locations through the valley and joined by your sister on Zoom on Wednesday and also at the 
book, uh, excuse me, the Woodstar, behind Woodstar at the Francis Crow Community Center, sponsored by BookLink on the 6th and at High Five in Florence uh, this Saturday, a new children's bookstore there. Uh, I've also been asking you, the listener, if you find the word ladies offensive. The future uh, uh, superintendent of East Hampton Schools was pre-fired, I guess, by because he sent an email using the word ladies. We'll hear from what you have to say about that via text at 1-800-639-9120. Uh, coming up in just a little bit. But um, Hannah Mushabek, as well as Michelle Mushabek and Gabriel Mushabek, all now U.S. citizens, but of Palestinian uh, origins, and yet, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I have been to to Jerusalem and in 1998, and and none of you have. What keep, makes it hard for you to go back there? And is it something that you do hope to to do someday? Let's start with you, Hannah, who you know has written this book through the lens of of your your father's generation. I think that that's one of the tragedies of displaced families. You know, when there are. Um, gatekeepers that can prevent you from accessing your homeland. Um, I think that that can be really difficult for subsequent generations. I would love to return. I would love to return with my family. Um, You know, there are barriers in place that have prevented us, but not just us, you know, Rashida Tlaib, who is, you know, a sitting congressperson, was also prevented from going back um, and, in fact, missed the death of her grandmother. So, you know, this is not something that is unique to our situation. This isn't even unique to Palestinians. And, you know, it's something that's really tragic about um, the effects of the refugee crisis. I do appreciate that you put in your uh, your artist bio at the end of the book. She lives in Amherst, Massachusetts, on the homelands of the Pocumtuck and Nipmuc nations. That's Col- right. Colonialism is uh, ac- across the globe and affecting people day in and day out. Michelle, what keeps you from trying to go back to the land that your daughter writes about in her first book? Uh, well, I'm 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 an outspoken critic of of uh, Israeli policies of Israeli apartheid. I write for Truthout.org. Uh, I write a weekly uh, newsletter at Interlink, and often uh, deals with uh, Palestinian and Israeli uh, issues and and uh, and. Uh, as much as I would love to go to Palestine and 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 go to Jerusalem, I think uh, that the Israeli government would not allow me to go in because of the type of books that I publish, because of my writing, and and so on. What about you, Gabriel? Have you made an attempt to go there, or do you have any desire to go back to the land that you haven't been to since you were eight years old? I would love to go, um, to be honest, but I feel the same way as my brother. I feel because of our activism as a family, uh, and the Mushabik name is a prominent uh, Jerusalemite name, if you will, I feel that uh, we would be given a very difficult time to go back, uh, even for a visit. And we do have still relatives who live there, um, but uh, we've heard many, many stories of close friends of ours who were just either returned uh, at the airport or just have, you know, spent hours and hours of interrogation. Um, And I'm not sure um, I want to go through that. Even when I went, I went through hours and hours of interrogation and people on the way trying to even leave Jerusalem uh, missed their flights because of the hours and hours of interrogation. And I understand the need for all human beings to feel a sense of security, but I also understand the need for all human beings to have a sense of home and place. And it's a beautiful book and a way to look at this through a lens, even thousands and thousands and thousands of miles away on the other side of the planet with this new book, Homeland, My Father Dreams of Palestine by Hannah Mushabek. Three events happening in short order, one on Wednesday via Zoom through the Odyssey Bookshop on the 6th, Thursday, the Francis Crow Community Room uh, behind Woodstar, sponsored by BookLink, your uncle's bookstore, and at High Five in Florence this Saturday at 10 o'clock with kids and Arabic music dance party. Now, I'm not putting you on the spot because I asked if this would be okay to start with you, Hannah Mushabek. I've been putting it out there uh, in an era where there is our people are getting called out for the different uses of language. The what would have been superintendent of East Hampton was pre-fired because he sent an email addressed to ladies and it was called a microaggression. What is your take on the use of ladies, Hannah Mushabek? <laughs> Again, I, d- I asked her permission. <laughs> I'm not just putting her on the spot. 
Well, from someone who has been called ladies many, many times in my professional life, it it, it definitely uh, makes me cringe a little bit, mm-hmm. um, particularly when I know that so many families in the Pioneer Valley have gender expansive, gender nonconforming children. So, you know, having a superintendent that maybe doesn't have the knowledge to recognize that this term might be problematic, you know, it, it, it is a red flag. Eight hundred six three nine nine one two zero. in the last couple minutes we have left if you want to send in a text about your thoughts about the use of the word ladies that this East Hampton superintendent or would have been East Hampton superintendent Vito Peron used in an email there will be a protest there uh, tonight in an attempt to try to uh, rescue his job Mary Lou Sullivan in Amherst uh, texted in I am a woman and I'm not offended when referred to as a lady there may be somewhat of a microaggression that there that I'm not sensitive to However, I think making that a reason to rescind a job offer is a huge overreaction, in my opinion. We also got another text, also from Amherst, Barbara Partee, retired linguistics professor, saying, for me, ladies as a form of address is simply old-fashioned polite, as in ladies and gentlemen. The only use of ladies that could seem offensive to me would be a reference to the little ladies or something like that. I'm an 82-year-old woman who has lived mostly in the East, Note that such usage varies considerably over regions, generations, and subcultures. Sociolinguists could tell you much more. So thank you for everybody who texted in your thoughts. We'll see what happens uh, with this protest tonight. We'll see if he's uh, uh, un-pre-fired and and rehired or if um, this microaggression will rise to the level of needing uh, to find a new superintendent for East Hampton. Meanwhile... Thanks again to everybody who's joined us in the studio here today, uh, Hannah Mushebeck, with your first book. Uh, any other books? You work for Simon & Schuster, so maybe you have an in there. <laughs> uh, is this the first of many books that we will be hearing about? Or? Oh, I hope so. <laughs> uh-huh. Any uh, any little tidbits that you want to give us? Any little teasers? Nothing I can talk about yet, oh, but it, it will be unapologetically Palestinian and unapologetically queer. Ah, interesting. And both in the same book. That's right. I think that's interesting, too, and maybe not something that is overly well covered. I'll also say, full disclosure, uh, that almost canceled myself earlier, that this people, when they hear Palestinian and Arabic, they often think Muslim, and I did, too. And I, you know, recognize that it was Ramadan for you all, but you're Palestinian and not Muslim. That's right. And if uh, my, you know, the amount of time I spent in the old city of Jerusalem divided into four quarters of the different types of uh, religious factions that come to that um, that beautiful and wonderful city that's got so much uh, tension. Uh, yeah, I apologize for assuming that about you. And it's good to know that uh, how, what's the percentage of, uh, of Palestinians that are non-Muslim that we that we know? I about? mean, nowadays, it's it's about perhaps under 10 percent. Uh huh. And Michelle, um, as I mentioned before, you are a musician for the Layali Arabic Music Ensemble. Uh, and I know that uh, during the pandemic, you were doing some things online. Any time we'll be able to see you in the near future? Well, I have uh, I have a couple of concerts coming up. Uh, there is a concert with the Layali Arabic Music Trio happening at the Ethel Barn, and this is a a new music series happening in Southampton mm-hmm. on April twentieth at seven p.m. Uh, where. You know, we'll we'll be playing some Arabic music, and I also have a, a flamenco ensemble, as you know, called Los Fiesteros, and we also have a gig on 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 May fourth in the Valley. The Mushebek family interlinking all things: books, <laughs> love, music. Thank you so much for coming and joining me in the fabulous four one three today. Tomorrow on the show, speaking of children's book authors, Northampton's own New York Times bestselling author and illustrator, Mo Willems, will be celebrating 20 years of his iconic pigeon not being allowed to drive a bus, as well as his new fundraising exhibit on Main Street in Northampton. And we'll meet the first female director of the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture, Deerfield's own Ashley Randall. Our director for the Fabulous 413 is Tony. I'm a getting it. Come on, Steve Dunn. Our engineer is Betsy, the two plus million dollar woman Cordis. Our technical team is Bart, pointing to the right satellite ranking. Kara, thanks for the batteries, Foster, and Punk Rock Dubay. Musical thanks to Spouse, the Happy Valley Guitar Orchestra, Monty Python, Def Leppard, and the Layali Arabic Music Ensemble. Khalees Smith will be back with us in the Fabulous 413 tomorrow. 
I'm Monty Belmonte. We'll see you then. Thank you.